At just after 1 p.m. on May 14, 2015, a neighbor called 911 to report a fire at 3201 Woodland Drive Northwest in Washington, D.C. The fire department rushed to the scene and were able to extinguish the blaze before it did too much damage to the large brick mansion. From the outside, there were broken windows and minor damage from smoke and flames. Inside, the firefighters quickly discovered the remains of multiple people. It's always a tragedy when a house fire causes the deaths of the people who live there. The only problem was that these victims hadn't died in the fire. This is Monsters. Darren Wint was born on November 27, 1980 in Guyana. He immigrated to the U.S. from Guyana in 2000. The same year, he enlisted in the U.S. Marine Corps but was discharged for medical reasons before he even made it to training. He remained in Washington, D.C., where he had family including his parents and two brothers. Between 2003 and 2005, Darren worked as a laborer and a welder for American Ironworks, a company run by Sava Savopoulos, a successful D.C. area businessman. Due to Darren's inability to get along with his co-workers, he was fired in 2005. Darren had an extensive criminal history from before the events of 2015. In 2005, his first victim of violence was his own family. His father, Dennis Wint, requested an order of protection after his own son repeatedly threatened to kill him and his wife. He called the police to have Darren removed during the incident, and even though police were present, the young man stood in the street and continued shouting that he was going to shoot his father and stepmother. He then called a girlfriend and continued the threats on her voicemail. Just so you know, just put me out and call the police. But this ain't over yet. So this might be the last time you talk to me. Because when I leave here, and I go back in the house, I'm going to kill each and every f***ing last one of them. I'm going to shoot each and every last one of them in the f***ing head. Because I always say this, I did too much. Too much for these f***ing people. And if I got to go, they're going to go with me too. So, I'm sorry. Bye. Darren served 10 months in prison for assault in 2008. He went back to prison after his girlfriend at the time reported multiple incidences of abuse. They included being thrown into a wall, thrown to the ground, and being repeatedly hit on her legs with his fists and a belt. In 2010, Darren pleaded guilty to malicious destruction of property. He had broken into a woman's apartment where he stole a television and vandalized her car. He later called the woman and said, quote, I'm going to come over there and kill you, your daughter, and your friends. He also bragged, saying things like he was good with a knife, not afraid of the police, and he could kill them easily. Another incident in 2010 would leave authorities scratching their heads five years later. Darren was arrested after police found him hiding behind a dumpster near the headquarters of American Ironworks. He had a two-foot machete and a BB gun in his possession. But at the time, authorities didn't know there was a connection between him and the company. The weapons charges were dropped when Darren pleaded guilty to possessing an open container of alcohol. Sava Savopoulos was born on September 25, 1968, the son of a Greek immigrant. His father, Philip Savopoulos, came to the United States to study engineering at the University of Maryland. He settled in Washington, D.C., where he founded American Iron Works in 1948. The company was successful, but it wasn't until Savas took over the business in 1995 that it really began to take off. He turned American Iron Works into a multi-million dollar company that only took on large construction projects. Savas actually studied law at the University of Maryland, but never practiced. He always worked with his father until finally taking over the company. 
He married his wife, Amy, in 1993, and the couple went on to have three children, Abigail, Katerina, and Philip. Savas and Amy participated in establishing the American Institute of Welding, an organization offering a fresh start to people who had lost their jobs. On May 13, 2015, Darren Wint gained entry into the Savopolis home, and what happened inside over the next 24 hours can't be confirmed. It's believed that he cut the phone line and then entered the house where their housekeeper, Veralicia Figueroa, who went by Vera, was finishing up her workday. Their son, Philip, was in his room as he had stayed home from school that day. An employee at a dog grooming company had tried to call the home at 3.15 p.m. to confirm an appointment for the following day and said they got no answer. It's thought that the call was made not long after Darren had cut the phone line. At 3.25 p.m., Amy was seen walking home in their neighborhood. Once she arrived, she was assaulted by Darren, who would have already had Vera tied up. It's unclear how he restrained Philip, but he would have easily been able to overpower the boy and subdue him. At 5.30 p.m., Amy called her husband and asked him to come home. This call is believed to have been forced so that Savas would come home, since he was an important part of Darren's plan. Once Savas was home, Darren now had most of the family and their housekeeper held against their will, which he could use to extort money out of the Savopolis family. Fortunately, 19-year-old Abigail and 16-year-old Katerina were both away at school. There's no way to know what happened in the house that night, but we do know that Savas sent a message to their other housekeeper to tell her not to come to work the next day. That message was sent out about 9 p.m. At about 9.30 that evening, Domino's Pizza was delivered to the house. It was reported that the pizza was ordered by a woman, believed to be Amy and was paid for with her credit card. The delivery instructions were for the food to be left on the front porch. At some point, Darren threatened the family into agreeing to give him $40,000 cash, and they spent the night developing a plan to get the money. The following morning, Savas called an assistant, Jordan Wallace, and asked him to pick up a package from the bank and bring it to his home. Savas called the chief financial officer of American Iron Works, Ted Chase, and asked him to okay a cash withdrawal from the bank in the amount of $40,000. Savas explained that he was going to an auction for construction equipment and was planning to make some purchases. Ted would later testify that it was unusual for Savas to request money in cash, but he seemed normal and calm so he didn't really think anything of it. While Jordan was picking up the package, Amy texted their other housekeeper to ensure that she was not coming to work. Vera's husband showed up at the house at around 9 a.m. looking for his wife. He knocked on the door but got no answer and left. Savas later called Vera's husband, telling him that Amy was sick and Vera had taken her to the hospital. Then Savas sent a message to his assistant, instructing him to put the package on the front seat of his Porsche in the garage and not to knock on the door as he would be in a conference call. Jordan delivered the cash to the Savopolis home just before 10.30 a.m. At some point over the following three hours, Darren killed all four occupants of the home. He strangled both Savas and Farah and beat all of them with a baseball bat. Then he stabbed Philip multiple times, likely with a bloody samurai sword that was left at the scene. The last thing Darren did was to pour gasoline over Philip, who was laying on a bed in one of the bedrooms and lit him on fire. It's believed that Darren stole valuables from the house and left in Amy's blue Porsche. He drove the vehicle to a church about 13 miles from the Savopolis house and set it on fire. That location was only about two miles from Darren's parents' house. At 1.24 p.m. on May 14th, the fire department arrived on the scene to extinguish the blaze. They found the bodies inside and the multi-million dollar home became a crime scene. When investigators searched the scene, they found a partially eaten piece of pizza inside the box in the kitchen. A DNA sample from the pizza would come back a match for Darren Wint. One of his hairs was found in the home and another was found inside of a hard hat in the garage. It's believed that Darren was wearing a hard hat and a high-visibility vest so as to not rouse suspicion while he was sneaking around the house. 
His DNA was also found on a knife that was being used to prop open a window in the basement. It's believed that he watched Jordan deliver the money from that window. When Amy's Porsche was located, there was a green construction vest inside that had Darren's DNA on it. In the early morning hours of May 16th, Darren's blue 2002 Ford Windstar minivan was found in the county just east of the Savopolis home. It was completely engulfed in flames and it's believed that evidence from the crime was in the van at the time of the fire. After the crime, Darren traveled to New York City and stayed with his then fiance Devani Hales. Once there, he told her that he had won the lottery and took her on a shopping spree where he paid for everything with $100 bills. Once the news broke that Darren was a suspect in the murders, he took a taxi all the way back to Washington, D.C., paying the driver $1,000 in cash. Devani called police after Darren left and informed them that he had been there, but she was not aware that he was a suspect until she saw it on the news. Investigators would later reveal that in the days after the murders, Darren had used his smartphone to make a couple of incriminating searches. He did an internet search for, quote, countries without extradition treaties with the U.S. and, quote, hideout cities for fugitives. On May 21st, back in the D.C. area, Darren enlisted the help of his half-brother, Daryl Wint, to formulate a plan to hire a lawyer and turn himself into police. Daryl asked two female friends to help buy multiple money orders which were supposed to be used to hire a lawyer. While Darren, Daryl, and some of Daryl's friends were traveling through the city, Daryl was on the phone with police, informing them of their whereabouts. A federal fugitive task force had located Darren at a Howard Johnson hotel and followed the group after they picked up Darren from that location. U.S. Marshals stopped the vehicles being used and arrested Darren. Daryl and his friends were released and Daryl continued cooperating with investigators. Inside the vehicles, they found $10,000 in money orders, a stack of money stuffed into a door compartment, and more cash on Darren. All of the cash was in $100 bills, which was how it was received from the bank. Police ended up recovering a total of $23,000 in cash and money orders. Wint was charged with 20 felony charges, including multiple counts of first-degree murder, kidnapping, theft, extortion, arson, and burglary. His defense argued that his brother and half-brother were the ones who committed the crime, but intentionally made it look like Darren was the sole assailant. Darren's defense was that he was framed by his brothers. Darren took the stand and claimed that he thought he was being hired to do some drywall and painting work for his brother Stefan, who was going to pay him $100. When he got to the house, Daryl asked him to put on a hard hat and safety vest before entering. Once inside, he was told that he didn't need to do any work. Instead, he would be paid $300 if his brothers could borrow his van. Darren claimed that he was upset about the change of plans and had thrown down the hard hat in the garage. He also took off the vest and gave it back to Daryl. He claimed that he did, however, let them borrow his van. After that, Daryl dropped him off at a friend's house where Darren claimed that he stayed the night. That was his alibi. He claimed that he spent the evening hanging out with a man named Ed and he ended up falling asleep on his couch. It was the following morning that Daryl returned to the house to pick him back up, but now his brother was driving a blue Porsche. Ed could testify that Darren was with him from the middle of the day on the 13th until the morning of the 14th, but he never did. That's because Ed was conveniently dead. He had apparently died just days after Darren had supposedly stayed at his house. Darren continued to testify that Daryl picked him up the following morning at about 11 a.m. in the Porsche and took him to the Savopolis home. Once inside, he said he was hungry and Daryl offered him some pizza. After taking a few bites, he threw the piece back in the box. He claimed to have not known there was anyone else in the home at the time. The problem with Darren's story, though, was that it didn't explain why his DNA was found on a knife in the basement. It didn't explain where he got $23,000 plus all of the money he had already spent. 
It also didn't explain how two construction workers who were working on a house across the street saw a single black male with long dreadlocks duck into the Savopolis garage on the afternoon of May 13th. On October 25, 2018, Darren Wint was found guilty on all 20 charges filed against him. He was given four consecutive life sentences without the possibility of parole. He will never be released from prison. Like many people on this show, Darren was someone who wanted something for nothing. He couldn't maintain a job and couldn't control his temper, so he decided to take what he wanted from his rich former boss. In the process, he killed four people, including a ten-year-old boy. Trading life for money seems to be a common act for a monster. If you're the victim of domestic abuse, please reach out to someone for help. Talk to your local shelter or call the National Domestic Abuse Hotline at 1-800-799-SAFE. That's 1-800-799-7233. Or you can go to thehotline.org to chat with someone online. This website is set up so that at any time, hitting the escape key twice will take you to a Google search page. That way, if your abuser is nearby, you won't get caught seeking help. If you're having feelings of harming yourself or someone else, or even just need someone to talk to, please contact your local mental health facility, call 911, or call Mental Health America, who operate the National Suicide Prevention Hotline at 1-800-273-TALK. That's 1-800-273-8255. They're available 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Thanks so much for letting me tell you this story. If you enjoyed it, subscribe on whatever platform you're on, hit like, rate us, or leave us a comment. You can also check out our other show, Somewhere Sinister, on YouTube or anywhere you listen to podcasts. If you'd like to support the show, check out our new merch at Teespring. The link is in the description. Thanks again, and be safe.